the learning process and just making sure they don't fall through the cracks may not be sufficient in helping them have the success in life that they might need. Finally, can teachers have even more impact? As a high school math teacher, I was kind of peanut buttered across hundreds of different things and hundreds of different responsibilities. What would it look like for me to focus my time on the things that I really made a difference in with my kids? What would those things be and how would we design school around that? At the end of the day, all these things boil down to, can learning be better? Can school be better? Can it be more inspired? And the tremendous energy that's in this room that's on the folks you're gonna hear from today. This is really what it's all about. So I'm really, really excited uh, for this morning. We're gonna have some fun. Uh, I'm gonna start off with a, another TFA core member who is a middle school math teacher right here in Washington, D.C. Uh, she works at Two Rivers Public Charter School. Every day she brings it. She has an incredible amount of love for her children. Clap for her like she does. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me in the back? Thumbs up, great. So, first off, good morning, and I'm really honored to be able to share my story with you. I hope you can find something you can kind of connect to. Every Friday night, I drive a carpool of students to a youth service at my church called Merge. During our weekly blows and grows, I heard a lot of things about what they did not understand, teachers who were doing a little bit too much, but one student had something really positive to say. Ms. Smith, I finally got my threes down. The thing is, Merge is for middle and high school students, and Dakota is a freshman at Thurgood Marshall, so she's not exactly on target for mastering grade level material. I was starting to think though, who was the teacher that taught her, or should I say failed her, and then I remembered that teacher was me. You see, Dakota has hit a wall in her mathematics journey called times tables. For others, it's calculus. For some, it's algebra. And for most of my middle school students, it's fractions. For me, my wall was trying to find out how to teach to the needs of 30 different students with 30 different walls all at one time. I was being told that if I could get my students to follow procedures with military precision, then I'd be able to take my 90 minutes and do an I do, we do, and then you do lesson plan, and they would meet those expectations. But in reality, this was falling terribly short. Professional development calls for differentiation didn't exactly tell me how I was supposed to teach the same grade level content to a group of students with similar bodies but had demonstrated math abilities that ranged anywhere from the second to the ninth grade. On a daily basis, I was frustrated because I felt like I was trying to get them to follow a plan, but we were in constant battles. But mostly I was just disillusioned because I felt like I see your passion, but you just don't seem to be inspired by what I'm doing here because I'm trying to teach this average student that doesn't exist. When I finally gave up that the factory model wasn't gonna work for me, I decided to switch to a station rotation where students learn new material from me. They then moved to a computer station where they worked on pen mark, and then they also spent time in partner work at a collaborative station. May I tell you that this dramatically improved the culture of my room alone as I suddenly had some more math content to share than I did behavior comments. Students found the variety of formats much more engaging as they were finally getting a challenge on their level. Even still, at the end of the year, some of my lovely eighth graders said, Ms. Smith, we are done taking tests. There's two weeks left, so can we just turn up? I don't want to do work anymore. It was at that time that I had two epiphanies. The first, my students still saw learning as something that you have to just get through. But secondly, I, the adult, was still at the center of this model. I was literally conducting when and where and how students were going to move, so it's no wonder that they were not moved to own their own learning. It was at this same time that I was trying to take ownership of my 
journey towards personalized learning, and so I joined the City Bridges Education Innovation Fellowship. Through a lot of school visits, our cohorts learned how students, teachers, admi admin, local policymakers were approaching education reform, and interestingly enough, they all had something in common. The design process. They were all committed to these five steps, the first of which is empathize. They took the time to hear the stories of students and parents and educators in order to gain insight into the value that should be driving their model of change. They then defined a core set of needs that they wanted to meet for their users. Third, they ideated outside the confines of scheduling, finances, traditional age grouping or curriculum sequences in order to prototype or create a small scale solution that they could then test get feedback on before scaling up or out. The design process gave me a framework for figuring out how to create and track change in my classroom, but most importantly, it empowered me to push my current classroom model even a little bit further along a personalized learning spectrum. Right now, when students enter my classroom, they receive this roadmap where they are allowed to fill in what they want to do during flex class after a 10 minute whole group lesson. They choose when, they choose how, within the week they need to have it all done. I've noticed that students step outside their normal social circles in order to collaborate with students on the grapple task. I have noticed students take victory laps around the classroom when they got their immediate feedback from Khan Academy and they finally got their five in a row. I need to be honest with you though, it's not lost to me that some kids sometimes take this freedom to socialize more than they work. And I'm still kind of struggling with this time constraint as one week doesn't guarantee a student's gonna master what I hope that they did. And it also makes project-based learning a bit more tricky. Even still, I'm inspired by the designers in other spaces and the results that they're getting. This, for example, is a personalized learning plan from Summit Public Schools. One day I hope to have something just like this where my students can navigate throughout their whole curriculum at the pace that they need. I'm also inspired by schools like High Tech High that are building creative confidence in their students by allowing them to work on real world projects that then culminate in authentic and meaningful projects. In these design thinking spaces and classrooms, there's this understanding that good things take time. It may seem like the big problems we're trying to solve need big solutions, things we've never heard of, but in reality, a lot of the things that we admire are the result of smart people taking the time to tinker with what's in front of them. These designers value process over quick and fast results, and they realize that the high quality solutions we need don't just happen, they're the result of just being committed enough to keep going back to the design process and keep iterating on your model. So you might be sitting here thinking, this is cute, this is good, personalized learning is you know, admirable, but it might not be necessary considering a lot of us in this room are products of a traditional model and it seems like you, know, you and I turned out all right. But I was just reading recently there's these studies that suggest that about half of college students are not becoming any more skillful after two years of college than when they first showed up, and about a third of them are making no gains even after those four years. So then I kind of start to wonder, is this the goal and measure of success for our students? Let's take a quick quiz. Could you please raise your hand if school helps you identify a passion that you are now currently working on? Could you please keep your hand up if you identified that passion before you graduated from high school? Then you would be the lucky ones and I am jealous of you. I would argue that most of our students would not be able to say what they are currently passionate about or if they can, not that they discovered it through school. And why should we expect otherwise when students tend to leave elementary school feeling like this and then go into the next seven years of their middle and high school experience literally counting down the hours until the end of the day, the end of the year, the end of those four years. As a math teacher, I had to do a little calculating and turns out that seven years of secondary school is roughly 1,300 days, which is about 10,080 hours. So 
Malcolm Gladwell happens to think that 10,000 hours is the same amount of time of deliberate practice needed to become an expert at something. So I'm sort of curious, what do you think our students are becoming experts at? Would you argue that it's compliance? Regurgitation? Disengagement? Or maybe self-management, self-awareness, and self-expression. I would argue that our typical schools are killing creativity and inquiry within our students. And without these skills, they are not going to be able to create meaning for their own lives or create solutions to 21st century problems like climate warming or world hunger or racism. I believe, though, that they would rise to the occasion of being given 10,000 hours to cultivate their interests into skill sets that they can then use to create purpose within their own context. I'm also more convinced than ever that this should not be happening on just a class-by-classroom basis, but on an entire school-wide model. Innovation thrives on clear intention and collaboration both of which are very difficult to maintain in an environment where everyone might be aiming at different targets. On the converse, I think that innovation is, the impact of innovation is compounded when everyone is on one accord that we are here and this school is here to disrupt the status quo and we are both empowered, encouraged, and equipped to do so. So right now, I'm excited about possibilities. What if a school entirely transformed their curriculum to be a series of creation courses, like a food truck finance or the chemistry of cooking, where the relevance of the content drives the class and it culminates in a product that proves their understanding? I'm excited about the possibilities of repurposing time into passion projects, where students could pitch ideas, form teams, use a design process to create solutions much like entrepreneurs would do in a startup weekend. I think I'd even be envious of students who got to attend a school where they could have apprenticeship afternoons, where they got to go into career fields of their choice and shadow people that are doing what they think that they want to do. I believe these opportunities should be a norm for students. And I can't tell you what it would do for test scores, but I highly believe it works wonders for the achievement gap, or should I say to close it, as students would have seven years of a head start on self-actualization before college. Ultimately, students cannot learn to be designers of their own learning or their lives if we, the adults in their lives, are also not doing the same thing. So no matter your connection to education, I challenge you to use the design process to take strategic risks within your spheres of influence in order to model the innovation that we hope to see in our students. I don't think personalized learning, I can't lie to you, personalized learning is a little bit daunting. And no, it's not gonna solve systemic root problems like poverty, but if I could remix President Obama, I'll leave you with this. The change that our kids need will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we are waiting for. We must design the change that we see. Thank you. I just want to thank Desiree. People ask me, hey, is this future of school stuff happening? And I say absolutely yes, because I meet hundreds of leaders like Desiree every day who are doing amazing, amazing things. I'm so grateful to be here to share with you this morning. So we're going to shift gears. I am super excited to be refereeing our personalized learning debate this morning. And we've got two amazing, sorry, my lapel mic's underneath here. So taking the red pill from Redwood City, California, I'd like to introduce Diane the Hurricane Kavner. Give it up. And taking the blue pill from Austin, Texas, Ben the Interleaver Riley. <laughs> so
So Ben and Diane have been very good sports to really get in the nitty gritty of some of the big issues around personalized learning. And there are two sides to this debate. We're going to put them out here. Um, Diane, I'm going to, we have a video here to give folks a sense of what Summit is. Maybe you can just give us what's a quick overview on Summit where we're going to see in this video. Yeah, I think what you're going to see in this video, first of all, I just have to pause and say, I'm so inspired by you, Desiree. That was phenomenal. Thank you. Um, what you're going to see in this video, I hope, is some of what you just heard. I think you're going to see kids um, talking about what it means to them to be empowered and to be in control of their learning and what they're doing. And I think you're going to see teachers embracing different roles of facilitating and coaching and guiding. Um, so that's what I hope you see. It comes down to the idea that it's not just about what the teacher does in the classroom. It's about what the teacher can support students in aspiring to do through the classroom. How do we give them what they need, step out of their way, and let them do the brilliant work that we know exists in their brain? Personalized learning to me means that every single student has um, a pathway that makes sense to them, that's connected to their long-term goals and aspirations. I guess you're not running in a track anymore. You're more running on a field, and you choose which direction you run to. Let's meet them where they're at and frame the teacher's role as all about facilitating an experience where each of those kids can make real meaningful progress. They are more center stage. They are not students who are sitting at their desks waiting to have like an education delivered to them. They're doing group work, they're doing hands-on projects. Last year in math, we had a project called event planning. I never knew math could be so fun. And the other day, someone actually asked me if they would help me plan some part, like surprise party for their dad. And I was like, I know exactly how to do that because I knew how to like create a spreadsheet and like put in everything that we needed to buy and our budgets and all that kind of stuff. We do a lot of group work in our projects and especially because we help um, our peers out. And this was a really pleasant surprise is how good the students have gotten at collaborating with each other and supporting each other. I think that the thing that surprises most people is about how the teachers aren't always in front teaching you stuff. You're teaching yourself. You can kind of work at your own pace because at my old elementary school there was like we couldn't go ahead even though I wanted to go ahead like so much. I've learned that I'm smarter than I think I am. I'm more responsible than I think I am. I can stay focused easier. So Diane, what do you want to share with us about you know, what Summit's doing? Uh, I guess what I want to share is that work with everyone here in this room and in the field. Um, I think that probably the best part of my story is that we're pretty normal, average edu educators who care a lot about kids and about five years ago felt like we weren't getting done what we wanted to get done and so started tinkering and testing and getting some discipline around that process and just going for it. And um, uh, today we've got a platform that other folks are interested in using and a model people want to see and we're pretty far away from where we ultimately want to be, but we have a pathway to get there. All right, Ben. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Fresh or rotten on this movie? <laughs> um, I feel like uh, I feel like I've been asked to play the George Foreman role in When We Were Kings. <laughs> so if you know the crowd starts chanting Taverner Boumaye, I'll know that I'm I'm losing the debate. Um, so look, I mean, one thing I'll just say right at the outset is that I've never visited Summit Public Schools. I've never been in your classroom, Desiree. Don't let that stop you. I have, exactly, I would love to see both, but I have very little doubt, almost zero, that they're wonderful schools and a wonderful classroom, right? So if, if the test today for me is that never does personalized learning work, I'm gonna lose that debate. The question that I'm posing, and I hope that we um, get into the mix on, is, is the test of an idea in the system, its best exemplars, or when it's done sort of on average. So what happens when you do personalized learning where it isn't Summit Public Schools, it doesn't have the resources that Summit has. And I say this as someone who's gone and visited those classrooms myself. This is not a position that I always held. I was a, a rabid enthusiast. I worked for policies and worked for an organization that supported a lot of these ideas. 
And it was only after I started realizing that more often than not, what I was seeing was not good pedagogy, was not leading to learning, and was actually something that looks superficially very exciting, but when you start to scratch the surface, you have to start questioning, really, is this the investment we should be making in that sort of system? Uh, talk to us just briefly about your work at the Ainsbury Endowment. Sure. So uh, I don't know if you can see it now that the lights are up, but um, this is much less uh, fun and exciting than a two-minute video. There's no kids in it. Um, but what my organization has done, uh, Deans for Impact, which is a group of deans of colleges of education from around the country. They're, they're it, very fun. What's that? They're, <laughs> they're very they're, fun. They're wild, yeah. You get a, you get a, get a few they? drinks in them, you would be amazed. Um, but what we've done is we've um, we tried to take a look at what does the science say about how learning takes place. And we've memorialized that in a very short, pithy, six-page document um, and listed all the scientific principles and then connected to connected them to practices that we thought teachers and educators might find useful. So it's free, it's available on the website. It's interesting because some of the practices that are discussed in there um, were already sort of obliquely referred to in Desiree's presentation. That 10,000 hours that Malcolm Gladwell popularized, um, which is a bit of a myth, by the way, but underneath that is research that's been done about developing expertise. And what that research says is that novices think very differently from experts. So when we think about personalized learning, if we take that principle seriously, we might question, like, should we have novices, i.e. students, being in charge of their own learning? Because the science of developing expertise, the science of deliberate practice, suggests maybe not. So Ben, should every child have their own learning path? And before you answer this question, I just want you to know, my kids are really, really special. <laughs> All right, continue. Exactly. They're beautiful, too, Alex. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, no, I mean, th th again, for me, there are schools like Diane's, there are schools out there that will create those paths, and they may be wonderful. There are, are, there are also schools, and I've seen them, where they've created those paths, and what happens is, uh, typically, in my view, the advanced students take that and run with it, okay? They, are, they, they enjoy having that freedom. The ones who are not, and I've seen this, there was one school that broke my heart in rural California, um, that's received a lot of attention, a lot of federal money for what it's doing around personalized learning, where they have 80 kids in a classroom with two teachers, and there were groups of kids in the back who were following their own path by just hanging out and playing on their phone. And when I went over to ask the teacher, so what are you doing about this? Like, she's like, well, you know, this is our model here. This is our system. And okay, so you go, well, that's not implementing personalized learning right. And of course, that's right, it's not, but that's the point is that this, this ideology that has sort of um, come to be the ways in which we're thinking about the future of innovation of schooling in practice is playing out in ways that I find truly disheartening. So I'm gonna start coming at this question from two perspectives. One of society, and I think society invests in public education for a return on that investment. I think what society wants and needs are individual people to be prepared and equipped to live a good life in their society, and I would call it a life of well-being. Um, interestingly, I think society's interests line up with individual families and students' interests. I think most of us actually want our kids to grow up and live a life of well-being. We want them to have purpose and relationship and community and financial stability. And so if I think about that, and I just take, um, talk to any parent who has more than one child, they will tell you that no child is the same. No person is the same. Which suggests to me, if we want each of those people to grow up, to live a life of well-being, we've got to figure out how to equip them for their pathway. They're not the same. And right now we've got a system where really there's only three possible outcomes and it's on one of those dimensions of well-being that they're measured. The three outcomes being you can drop out of high school, you can graduate from high school, or you can be ready to go on to some sort of college or post-secondary work. And there are really different economic outcomes for each of those and no differentiation around purpose and um, community and relationship and some of those other things. And so what I'm interested in is designing a system that actually figures out how to individualize and personalize the pathway so everyone can realize a full sense of well-being. Um, so I think uh, it is true, of course, that everybody in this room and everybody in the world is different. 
Um, and but just sitting here, if we think about it, like you can just look around. We have different um, different sizes of bodies. We have different things that we like to eat or not like to eat. But digestion for most of us in this room happens the same way. And the same is actually true with how our minds work. Cognition, for the most for most of us, there are important exceptions to this rule, happens the same way. So the question is, like, there's this revolution happening in psychology and cognitive science that's coming up with all of these insights about the commonalities in the way in which we learn and make sense of the world. And like, so there's like this incredible scientific revolution happening on the one side, and then our education system is actually moving in exactly the opposite direction from that. Instead of harnessing around the commonalities in the ways in which we think, we're trying to design for the exceptions or the unique aspects, the snowflake qualities. There's a number, like, leaving aside the fact that the science suggests that that might be ill-advised, it's like, think about how hard we're making the system. We're now saying that, like, we actually have to design around something that individualizes for, in this country, somewhere between 60 to 70 million different students. Again, you have to be pretty confident that we can do that right at scale uh, to think that that's the way to go. So, Diane, we've heard Benjamin talk about uh, self-directed learning a little bit. Uh, self-directed learning sounds like an awesome idea until you watch a fourth grader Google hilarious pet photos for three hours straight. Uh, are kids capable of self-directed learning? So, yes, and I don't think there's any until. Um, uh, the reality is, let's all take one moment right now and think about our lives as adults if we were not capable of learning. Imagine if you literally right now in your life could not learn something unless someone told you what to learn, when to learn, how to learn it, and if you learned it. Could you be a functioning adult? Mm -mm. So the good news is the ability to learn is a skill. These are skills. People learn the skill of learning. And so what we're talking about here, I agree completely that there are massive commonalities and that's, we should build the commonalities around skills, not about content knowledge or discrete pieces of knowledge, which is how the system is currently built. And so um, self-directed learning is what we should be asking ourselves is how do we actually take the K-12 experience and ensure that every child leaves it fully equipped with the set of skills to learn for the rest of their life. I have long seen school and districts mantras that state, we're creating lifelong learners. And I want to say, no, you are not. BS, you are not. There is nothing you're doing here that's helping to create lifelong learners. What you're doing is creating compliant people who can learn when you tell them to learn. So what we actually need to focus on is the act of teaching kids to learn. The rub is, we want them to learn what we want them to learn on our time schedule. And so when we make a trade-off in schools right now, we trade off the time spent to teach them how to learn in favor of making sure that they, quote, have learned what we wanted them to learn at that moment in time. And that's the thing we need to think, rethink. So I'll, I'll try to make this a little spicy here. I mean, uh, or spicier. So I don't think you actually believe what you just said, Diane. And I say that because everybody sitting here listening to us in this room, um, if they're understanding what we're saying, they're listening in the English language. So when you said a moment ago that we shouldn't focus on content knowledge, actually, probably the first thing that parents worry about is, are my kids learning to read and speak at the level at which we would expect? At the ages, you know, if, they're, if you're at age three, four, or five, and you're not seeing that progression, like, you're concerned, and you start to ask your teachers what's going on, right? So content knowledge in the form of understanding the alphabet is sort of the first step on our way to cognition. One of, I think, the single biggest innovation of humanity is the ability to do that and the ability to do that in common. And when we talk to someone who doesn't speak English, you can see the breakdowns that happen because of that lack of shared content knowledge. So from my perspective, it is of course true that as we move later into life that we gain more agency over what it is we find interesting. The reality is, particularly in the early part of our system, we are very much focused on content knowledge. And it turns out, this is another one of the principles that's in the science of learning and one of the things that the cognitive scientists have studied is that the ability to be a lifelong learner, quote unquote, depends almost, not exclusively, but heavily on content knowledge. 
your ability to make sense of the world depends on whether or not you can connect the thing that is new to you to something you already know and fit the new pieces in. And so, so if we were to take that principle seriously, it would actually move us in exactly the opposite direction of the personalization movement. Because we would actually be saying, so what are the content pieces that matter for kids to know so that they can leave when they finish their formal schooling and be able to make sense of the world themselves because they have it in their head? You want to hit that? Yeah. Because <laughs> um, I think, first of all, we should define content knowledge. So you just define content knowledge as the learning of the alphabet. But let's talk about later. Um, Oh, the content knowledge I'm talking about in grades 6 through 12 that we're assessing as a nation are facts and figures. Um, what, what I actually think you're speaking to, reading, writing, the ability to speak, the ability to analyze, those are skills. Those are cognitive skills that are applied across multiple disciplines as you get past the basic um, levels of learning how to, learning to read and then using reading to learn. Um, and so I think that maybe we're talking about a different place in the scale of the K-12 continuum. Uh, but we're not measuring the kid's ability to read when we're in high school with our standardized tests. What we're measuring is, do they know what the three causes of World War II were? And things like that. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about content knowledge. And certainly you need to know stuff in order to be able to think and analyze and function in the world. But Perhaps most importantly, you need to have the skills in order to find out that stuff and learn that stuff. Because there's no way that kids leave our doors in 12th grade knowing all the content in the world they're going to need. Certainly not the, pa the rapid pace of our world today. So aren't we better served equipping with them with those skills that they will need to learn for the rest of their lives, the content knowledge and what to do with it and how to discriminate against it? with it, between it, and what's good and what's bad and what makes sense and what's a reliable source and those types of skills, along with a whole bunch of other skills that are really important. All right, round's over. Sir Ken Robinson, the most watched TED Talk in history, says every child can create and innovate. But if you look at the internet, Ben, 1% of people are creating, 9% are just retweeting other people's stuff, and 90% are just lurking. Should we design our schools to bring out our inner Elon Musk or Steve Jobs, or should we just say, you know what, we're going to be number one in passive consumption, and let's double down? Yeah, I am the 90%. <laughs> so, um, I mean, look, again, the question is, you know, uh, Sir Ken Robinson's thing, it's so fun to watch, right? But there's this notion that we, we, we know very little about how to instill creativity, OK? That's what makes creativity almost by definition creative, is because if you could instill it, it no longer is creative, okay? So the notion that we should be designing our education system to be around creativity, again, the goal is to have, I think, students who are intelligent, thoughtful, curious. The creativity comes because they have that ability to be, you know, to make sense of the world, to grapple with it. And then you start to see people who want to push the envelope. They are either the Elon Musk or the artists of the world. But you don't design your education system to create the Elon Musks. You don't. You know, you hope that those emerge in your society. I mean, it's an interesting example you give that kids. It's like, don't we want our kids to know some of the causes of World War II in common? I mean, isn't that worth a I, I actually want them to understand them. I don't want yeah. them to regurgitate them. Sure. I mean, nor do I want regurgitation. But I think, like, learning those facts and being able to converse about them will help them when they think about things like what's happening in Syria today. That's where this sort of connection between knowing the past and grappling with the future comes into play. So I might surprise you on this one, but um, <laughs> I, I would... I would agree with Ben on this one. I think the idea right, of, um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think I agree. Uh, the idea of innovation as a noun and not a verb doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. And I know that sounds strange coming from the person who a lot of people think are innovate, is innovating. I live in the city in the world that has the most self-driving cars on the planet. Like I spend many of my days with the quote, the most innovative companies. And yeah, I have innovation fatigue. Um, it is like this silver bullet that everyone's in search of. And um, I don't want to design a system to create innovators. That doesn't make any sense to me. It's back to let's make all the kids the same. 
I don't think our world needs all innovators. Um, now, are there really fundamental skills that enable people to go through an innovative process that are valuable that, that we should all have? Absolutely. If we do K-12 right, will kids have the skill set to innovate? Totally, but that shouldn't be our end. So Dan, I carefully track the hours my kids listen to All Things Considered because I think it's correlated with a whole bunch of important life outcomes. <laughs> what are the outcomes besides reading a math score should we be tracking? I'm gonna give Ben a break here and pummel you for a minute. That's like <laughs> a terrible outcome to track. Um, so, um, so I think uh, assessment is one of these places where um, our profession drives me a little bit crazy. Like, I actually think this is the most important um, challenge facing us today, is we need to be leading on what do we actually value in terms of outcomes for our kids and how can we assess those? And most often what I hear people say is, well, there's all these things we care about, but they're really hard to measure, so and we just continue, continue to accept these very narrow measures. And I actually think that we need to lead as a profession on getting in there and figuring out how to measure the things we care about because what you measure is what you value. And if you don't measure what you value, it's not gonna get done. So because you asked, I actually have a list. Um, so, I think there are eight domains of cognitive skills, and we can fight about these with 36 dimensions, but I think they're pretty much in the ballpark of what the research would agree with, and that is, and we should definitely measure kids on these year after year after year, and they include things like um, textual analysis, uh, using sources, inquiry, analysis and synthesis, composing and writing, speaking and listening, products and presentations. I think we need to really measure habits of success, and that's our term that we've used because the field can't even figure out a term for these things. It includes emotional intelligence, um, strategy, uh, self-directed behaviors such as strategy shifting, appropriate help seeking, challenge seeking, response to setbacks, um, academic uh, learning strategies like time management, note taking, test taking, and studying, reading, and comprehension, and academic mindsets like academic belonging, growth mindset, self-efficacy, and belief in the value of work. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, the last example was the one I wanted to actually use to talk about what I see happening in the system today that may be familiar to many people in this room who are practicing teachers. So um, you may have read Paul Tuff's book or you may be familiar with Carol Dweck. If you've heard of the word grit, um, they're responsible, right? So you're starting to see uh, in education systems in various places, a desire to measure grit, okay? We're going to develop that sort of system of measuring grit, or is the school gritty or the kids gritty? Now there's a whole issue around that that we're, I don't think is appropriate to touch today around some of the racial dynamics that get played into that. So leave that aside. If you actually listen to Carol Dweck, who's brilliant, the researcher who developed all this, she's running around the country right now telling everybody to chill out. Okay, that actually what's happening is there's been radical misinterpretation of what uh, having a growth mindset means. And people think that as long as they, you've got teachers saying like seven positive things to a student, there's demonstration that it's gritty and that they've like hit that metric, okay? And, and I'm not kidding, like even in the DC system, the impact evaluation system, there's some of these components to the evaluation and you're just seeing sort of this pantomime going on by teachers. And if you're a DC public uh, school teacher, you may know what I'm talking about. So again, I go back to not the ideal. The ideal, of course, you would love to have some sort of system where we could peer inside everybody's mind and be able to figure out you know, exactly where the learning was activated and where it wasn't. But we don't design to the ideal. And I actually think that um, if we spent more time focusing on the one thing that is fairly easy relatively to identify, which is, have you mastered the content? Have you mastered the understanding? Do you know these facts about the world, both in subjects that we test and some of the subjects that I think we don't that we might think about? We might actually get a lot further at getting those second order things like grittiness, resiliency, collaboration, those things that we would like to see in our students that you typically see in high functioning schools where the kids have learned a lot of the content. So does, oh, mm. All right, all right. <laughs> so grit was not on not my the list. the first time or the last <laughs> time. <laughs> grit was not on my list for that reason. But um, so we work directly with Carol and team on this. And so um, there is something really important to note that we're not gonna give a standardized test on these things, but what you can do and what is effective is look at a student's self-perception around mindsets, 
the people around them's perception of that student's mindsets, and you can correlate that with their performance on academic measures, and you can start to see where things are misaligned, and you can actually properly intervene then. That's the type of assessment I'm talking about in order to actually do something about it. Right now, we don't measure it, and we have no idea what to do about it, and so if you have it or getting it from home, great. If you're not, you're not getting it at school. So, end of the round. Uh, in a couple minutes, we're gonna have, we're gonna have Bell. From, I know, I was gonna have a whistle, but I was too, I was too much time. Uh, in a few minutes, we're gonna hear from Max Ventia, uh, founder and CEO of Alt School, doing some amazing work, uh, both around school models and education. Uh, last time I was a panel with Max, he actually jumped in World Wrestling Federation <laughs> style before, so I just wanna give you two guys up before I ask this question. Technology and education, Diane, second coming or end of times? Gigantic opportunity? You want me to expand? Back, back to you, Ben. <laughs> well, I mean, this is where, you know, Diane said she agreed with me with something, so I think I can say that, too. So I, I have been very careful when I have uh, given these screeds against personalized learning to say it's not about technology. And in fact, I think the people who support technology in education would be wise to start to distance themselves from the personalized learning movement because there's actually many, many ways in which technology can be wonderful in schools. What happens is if you wrap this up in the ideological banner of personalization, the studies are coming, folks. Like the research is coming out. I mean, just this week, you know, the Walton Family Foundation was, you know, woke up to the fact that online charter schools suck. Right? And it was a entirely predictable, if you looked at learning science, that that would be the case. Entirely predictable. Okay? So I, I am going to make the prediction now that as we move forward with personalization, we will see exemplars where it's fantastic, but we also will start to see the stuff that I have seen with my own eyes start to emerge. And so if you're pro-technology like I am, if you think that there are ways in which technology can assist learning and that the creative teacher should be able to, in their classroom, you know, hand out a device if that's what will work, you know, and be able to access the World Wide Web, the internet, and have actual functioning internet, then be for that. But recognize that technology is actually sort of just one of like a thousand tools that should be in an effective teacher's toolkit. So I want to actually cut through some of the, you know, the headlines and applause lines we use around technology. If you look at medicine and you go into a hospital, uh, no doctor will just say, I just know. They're going to use the MRI machine. Uh, there are constant technologies to see if you've made the right dosage, to see if you're doing stuff on time, because people make mistakes. What's fascinating is education, no one actually ever talks about, you should get a second opinion. Or maybe that diagnosis was wrong. And in medicine, we're actually using technology to help try to address some of those issues. So you know, how, do, how do we think about that analogy within the context of education? Yeah, I think I th it makes me think of two things. So first of all, in my experience, um, and certainly when I was pregnant, uh, this came very clear to me. No one cares about your health the same way that you care about your health. And your doctor is empathetic and cares, but not the way that you care about yourself. And so I learned very quickly that if the more information I had and the more I paid attention and owned my own health, the better partner I was with my doctor who wasn't there every day and minute with me. And so I could actually really leverage that relationship. And so I think there's a great analogy here and what technology enables is putting really quality information in the data in the hands of parents and kids and the people who care the very most so that the teacher can be um, a really good partner with them but not the end all be all. And then I think the second piece is, um, you know, if we continue to focus on this sort of single teacher, single classroom, responsible for these kids without any sort of redundancy or multiple eyes on things, you will have this problem of uh, with the best intentions, only one diagnosis and no sort of collaboration around that. And I think there are structures in schools that actually, and, and technology and data support this, that enable a much broader view on kids, um, certainly what we're seeing in our schools. So I, I just, now, now having debated Diana, I'm gonna turn on the moderator, I'm gonna turn on the ref and attack him, world, war, world wrestling Quite style. These yeah, because um, I disagree, Alex. I, I think we get second opinions in education all the time, and it's called, it's called war on teachers. yeah, well, there's that, but it's called assessment, right? I mean, that's what an assessment is. 
And it's really interesting. I spent a year in New Zealand studying the New Zealand education system. So if you'll forgive me, I'm just going to go into this for a minute, but it will make sense. The New Zealand high schools, um, they test everything. Okay, they have, ass they have assessments for like 60 different subjects. These are all available, by the way. You can go on and get them if you're a high school teacher and want to see what they test in. But what's interesting in New Zealand is that they have two forms of assessments. They have what are called internal and what are called external, okay? The internals are the ones that we might call formative, but they're also just sort of checks along the way that the teachers give. And then there's the external assessment, which is mostly what we're familiar with in the form of like the state tests or whatever the you know, uh, larger system test is using for school and sometimes teacher accountability. Okay, so here's what's interesting. There's data on this. In fact, the New Zealand Herald published a fascinating data visualization where you can go and look at the different schools in New Zealand based on the type of students they serve and the alignment between the internal and the external assessment. So if you go to a what they call a high decile school, which is you know wealthy kids, the overlap is almost entire. So like if you if a, if your teacher says that you are on grade level, you're mastering the content, that lines up with the external assessment. Okay, you go into decile one schools, the high poverty schools in New Zealand. What you'll see is that on the internal exams, the kids are scoring about as well as the kids in the high decile schools on the internal. And then when the external exam comes, it falls off a cliff, falls off a cliff. And so in my opinion, this is the danger of personalized learning, is that when you create this ability to sort of, you know, you think that you can individually assess whether or not mastery is taking place, and the system is no longer designed, that there can be any external check on that because it no longer makes sense to have an external check. The whole system has been designed for personalized learning. You're not going to be able to find that out until the life outcomes for those kids who got screwed have played out in their form of not being able to have the life that we would like them to have, or at least the opportunities that we would like them to have as the result of the system providing them the education they should get. Right. We're running out of time, so I'm going to go one more question, and then we're going to do a lightning round. Uh, so last question. Last year, Congress came to a bipartisan consensus that it wanted to give NCLB a good smack. Is the pendulum going to swing back all the way in the other direction? Are my kids destined for eight years of macaroni art, farming delicious kale, and uh, great job stickers? So, so I, think, I think the good news is, is that um, history matters. Like, yes, there is pushback, and I think rightfully so, to some of the things that happened in the No Child Left Behind era. But I do think, like, completely unwinding the clock and saying that we're no longer going to have, you know, standards or expectations um, is it, that it, it's hard for me to imagine we'll go completely into the kale producing direction of schooling. Um, it's, it is good for you. I do think, though, that. Um, you know, what you will see is what we've seen prior to No Child Left Behind is that the places that probably need to have that external accountability the most will be the first to make use of this new freedom in ways that lower expectations for kids. Um, so that's the danger, and, and frankly, I see our entire political structure in the United States sort of bifurcating as a result of that, and the underinvestment in education, you know, I'll just go ahead and say it, in particularly in the Deep South and in parts of this country, um, I think that you're seeing some of the uh, ramifications of that in our current presidential campaign. I think it depends on uh, what the people in rooms like this decide to do actually, and I think that um, there's one pathway where um, t the two sort of ends of that spectrum um, encamp even more and decide that they're gonna dig in and try to, to, to win outright one way or the other, and I actually think if that happens, the pendulum will swing the other way. Um, I actually think, having been sort of uh, a part of one of those, uh, <laughs> I guess the, the prevailing camp for the last period of time. Um, I'm questioning a lot of my assumptions and my beliefs, and I actually think there is a middle ground that we need to move to, and that we are experiencing a natural correction that should in fact happen, and I actually wanna be a part of that third way solution so that we don't swing all the way back. Um, but I think there's a lot of folks who, like I said, are in rooms like this and who I spend a lot of time with that aren't necessarily there yet and are really deciding if they're gonna sort of uh, dig in and, and entrench, and um, I hope that that is not the case. All right, we're gonna shift to our lightning round. At the very, very most, a one-second response. One second? I'm sorry, one, one <laughs> sentence response. 
<laughs> at the very, very most. Uh, I mean, extra credit for two to three word responses. All right, I'm just gonna run through. Uh, you know, I'll let you guys just popcorn in and we're just gonna go real fast. First lightning round prompt. The Martian, starring Matt Damon, directed by Ridley Scott. Winner of best audiobook performance. Uh, TL semicolon DS. Sugata Mitra, The Hole in the Wall Experiment. Uh, go back in time and end one person's life might be his. A good reminder of what children are capable of, not a school model. Growth mindset. Common misconception, a, it is a state in which a person can be, it is not something that you have. Uh, 100, over 100,000 schools in this country, Carol Dweck can't work with all of them. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> have you ever met her? Khan <laughs> Academy. Hmm, Sal's my neighbor, and <laughs> his, his neighbor's dog is named Sal, which provides a lot of confusion. What can I say to that? Uh, I, I bank at Bank of America. Sometimes I see Sal in the ads for them, so. <laughs> I actually had to look this turn up, term up. Generation Z, the post-millennials. Let's hope they're not zombies, and if they are, Brad Pitt's available to help us. Uh, they would have gotten my horrible joke about TL semicolon DS. <laughs> Homeschooling. We run two of the best homeschools in Washington State. <laughs> <laughs> if you know a Washington State sen a re a representative, please encourage them to vote on the charter bill that's in front of them. Uh, Semi-serious comment, homeschooling undermines the entire nature of public education. One of my life's greatest loves, second to my husband, of course. Also one of my greatest loves, second to Diane's husband. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. mm -hmm. Minecraft. Oh, my 13-year-old son's obsession. And ironically, the place I hear him most expressive when he's playing it and Skyping with his friends. Digital Legos, kind of cool. Fitbits for kids where schools measure everything. Stress, heart rate, sleep, breathing, raised voices, dot, dot, dot. I'm so curious to hear what <laughs> you're going to say. Uh, yeah, it's forthcoming in the new charter school known as Gattaca. Uh, interesting opportunity for prototyping, for testing, for experimenting. We should be really thoughtful about what we're actually trying to solve for there. Virtual reality. Oh, this is how I'm going to uh, ensure that my schools don't become zoos. So <laughs> we're going to go for it and see if we can do uh, virtual reality tours. Uh, I feel like virtual. I'll, I'll answer for Ben. Yeah. The, the next uh, forum where Ben's going to complain about technology, the, the <laughs> avid proficient user in it. <laughs> All right, please give my good friends, Diane Tavner and Benjamin Riley, a huge round of applause. Thank you. No. you guys are awesome. Thanks for being here. Uh, these guys were such good sports, have so much going on, and I'm just really, really grateful that they could join us. Um, I am going to take off my referee shirt here. And if we could dim the lights for a little bit, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we're going to wrap up here with a uh, couple of a uh, couple more segments. The first one, as I previewed, as I teased, uh, our good friend Max Matias here, the CEO and founder of Alt School. Uh, a lot of folks have heard about Alt School. This is really a chance to get to know what they're up to, and I'd like to uh, give us a warm welcome to Max. Why don't you take that? <laughs> I think we've got that. Got the second one. I'm so impressed, by the way. You guys really know how to fill a room last minute. <laughs> it's, I, I wouldn't doubt it, but you've pulled through. I, I told Max it was a big night last night. It'd be like the it Lakers game. Everyone would show up in the second quarter if you guys, uh, you guys came through. Um, 
So welcome, Max. Uh, you know, a lot of folks have heard the buzz around alt school. I'm not really sure. If, you know, everyone knows exactly what's uh, going on there. Uh, we've got a video uh, for them to actually see live in action what it is. But maybe you can kind of tell us a little about you and see how we're going to see in the video. Sure. Um, so I've been a technologist for the last couple decades. Um, started. Uh, a couple technology companies, including a search company that Google bought, um, and was the head of personalization there. And uh, you know, my mom was an educator, my teacher's an educator. She's now actually a teacher in alt school, but I wasn't an educator myself. And it's important to note that I'm still not an educator. Um, alt school is a network of micro schools aiming to deliver a very personalized education without an over reliance on kind of digital learning and screen time. But most importantly, all schools the kind of platform that might enable a different kind of ecosystem where we have lower barriers for people to do great things in education, where we have more interoperability so that the good things can spread, and we have more of an ability to pull in the things from outside education that might really make a difference. All right, so I'm going to show them the video just so people can see what we're talking about here. We started Alt School from the ground up and we were able to ask parents what do they want from a school and they were unequivocal. They wanted a school that their children loved to go to where a personalized education provided them with not only the skills and experiences they need for the 21st century but tapped their own learning style, their own interest to make them confident as learners and to make them confident as people. Once a student has a personalized learning plan we can curate a playlist for them. And a playlist is a set of learning experiences. That playlist guides the child every single day in the classroom. And we also built inline assessment into our playlist. And that allows the teachers to give the students timely feedback. Children don't just learn on a screen. We think children learn best in a group. They learn best when they're learning to take on the perspectives of others. So their learning experiences on their playlist might be an individual activity, a small group activity, or a large group activity. And within that playlist, the children can reflect on the learning experience. What was it like for them? Was it too easy? Was it too hard? Did they need help? How did they get help? So Max, we talk about reinventing school and you know, what if we could start from scratch? you actually had that opportunity. You've got this incredible team, you have a pretty amazing set of resources. You know, what, it, what, it was, what is it like to be able to do it from the ground up? Uh, it's really hard and really exciting. Um, and you know, I wanted to kind of put something up there to, to convey kind of the complexity of what we're trying to do, um, but also to convey kind of how hard it is to even frame this in our own minds, right? So this is meant to be a little bit of a tangled mess um, because I, I think that's what it is. Um, you know, what, what is really different about alt school and what uh, I'm incredibly grateful to, you know, the, the people that are on this team and, and to the backers that we have to allow us is, you know, we get to do things at three levels at once. We get to think about what could instances of school look like? How can those instances function? How can we start you know, a different form factor of school from the typical, you know, 500 person big stone building that is a kind of institutional weight automatically in and of itself. But we also get to think about, you know, what is a native 21st century pedagogy model? How can that play out in many different instances of school and form factors of school? And then we get to go a level deeper and we get to say, you know, what are the technical capabilities and what are the cultures and what are the incentives that might create a different ecosystem that would allow ultimately many different education models. And so, you know, in some senses, we're like flying the plane while we're, uh, while we're building the plane, while we're figuring out, you know, what air should be like. And, um, and it sounds completely ridiculous, except when you look at other industries and you see that kind of thing playing out, most notably with the internet, where the people that started in the internet early were just working on an instance of an experience. They were selling you a book. They were creating a bulletin board, you know, for a bunch of Harvard kids to use. They were creating, you know, a, a, a better way to get very, very little bits of information for Stanford grad students. But then over time, they became a platform for other people to build experiences that were somewhat similar. 
And then in the long run, they became kind of a pillar of an ecosystem that allows completely different things than content and commerce. And so you know, that's what we're trying to do as part of an ecosystem that we might be a small but catalytic piece of. And it's really about starting from first principles. So Max, you talked about these three different levels of, of things that you're working on. What does this mean for a kid? So I'm a kid, I walk into school, how many other kids are there? What am I doing? Like, what, 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 what does it mean to be an involved school? Well, so the first thing that we thought was very important to allow more flexibility and allow more innovation and permeability into the education experience and into the community from the school was to say that the, the unit of learning shouldn't be the building and the 500 people, it should be the classroom. And so we have independent classrooms, you know, generally maybe four of them in one site, um, but those classrooms tend to be bigger, they tend to be more multi-purpose, they'll have about 25 kids in them, they'll have one teacher and then a number of other resources that are out to kind of orbit that classroom and be part of it. And you know, from nine to three, the children in that classroom are working on the types of things we would typically have them learn. I think there was a false dichotomy in the last kind of discussion where it's not personalization or content. It's, it's obviously a great consensus baseline of what are the things that kids should learn, but then a flexibility off of that baseline. And you need to have both. One without the other is insane, right? And so it's the attempt to do that, is to create a great baseline experience, but in a small enough and responsive enough container where different kids have the structural flexibility to do different things and to learn in a different way. So <coughs> my nine-year-old walks into alt school. What does that look like in practice in the next day? They sit down. There's First of all, you have an hour flexible window in which you can show up, so yeah. you don't have that insane, like dragging your kids to school to stress everybody out to start You're the day. You're going to get the Nobel Peace Prize for, um, for that, by the way. It's completely self-serving as a parent yeah. of two young kids. Yeah. Um, and, and then at you know nine, there'll be a kind of circle time. They'll get together with their uh, classmates, they will talk about you know what's happening in the day, they'll kind of reflect on what happened yesterday, and then there'll be a long block of what we call playlist time from about 9 a.m. to maybe one, where you know kids are moving through different stations, they are mostly learning in small groups, but there's the flexibility, so if something is a waste of kids' time, they might do something else that isn't a waste of their time. And Again, this is the early stages of it. It's not like it's working the way that we want it to, but I like what Diane said. We, we have a sense of where we can go over the very long term, and we feel like we're on that path. And then in the middle of the day, you have a kind of extracurricular or co-curricular block. Kids are eating lunch. They're doing some kind of athletic activity. As well, in the morning, there, there's kind of recess, and we try and have as much physical activity as possible. And then you have another playlist block from about one to three, and then from three to six, you again have a flexible pickup window as a parent. Three hours, you can kind of pick your kid up when makes sense for you that day. And you can manage what happens during that block where we can bring kids together from different classrooms to do those kind of co-curricular activities where you don't want a generalist. You want someone who really knows about that topic and you want children who are actually paired by level and interest that might be in totally different classrooms the rest of the day. So. <coughs> you're not a tech company, you are training teachers, you're thinking about pedagogy and curriculum, you've got the resources, the expertise to build the technology around it. I remember when I first <coughs> got to visit you, you walked me into a room and you showed me a microphone. And this is one of the things that I remember. And the microphone sat on the top of the classroom and in a noisy classroom of 30 kids, it could laser in into a single kid's conversation and discover and, and, and capture that learning moment for one kid in a busy classroom. So I mean, these are the types of things that you're building to enhance uh, school. I mean, talk to me about uh, you know, what are some other things you're doing from a technology standpoint to really you know, help schools function in a different way. So the main thing is you know, the worst piece of technology is one that replaces a human interaction. The right pieces of technology set up the human interaction. They tend to do it by either offering suggestions that a human can use with their superior judgment or giving information to a person that they can use to come up with a thesis or acting as a kind of force multiplier, taking as what you'd already do and allowing you to do it faster or better or more easily or more satisfyingly than you could. And we're interested in the kind of products that work at a structural level where you actually need to have a different culture and a different set of behaviors in order to take advantage of them. And those are the technologies that are very difficult to build when you have to sell to existing very large top-down organizations and kind of earn your keep from venture capitalists who pay for the next little increment of development. 
Those are the kind of technologies that we think that we can build by being full stack and by controlling the education experience at this small scale and early stage. Though of course the end goal is to build an ecosystem for others. And I'll bring up, besides the kind of things that we do on the school formation side and the back office side, where frankly it's really the most interesting. It's like, how do we create the possibility where people can start micro schools much easier, where they can be part of a network? That's a little bit harder to kind of make a screenshot for, but this is the stuff that we think sets up a classroom experience. And so you have three things here. You have a student playlist. This is not new. You will see hundreds and hundreds of different playlists that people build. But what's interesting about our playlist, which again does those two things, it allows a child to curate their own experience. It's a mixed kind of calendar, to-do list, communication tool, documentation framework. They can use that tool to exercise a greater amount of flexibility. This is what technology can do. It allows complexity to be cheaper. It's like a 3D printer where you can print a kind of crazy shape because you don't have to whittle it by hand. It can actually be cheaper to be more flexible and to be more complex. And when you have 25 kids in a classroom pursuing different trajectories and a teacher has to make sense of it, the only way to do that is to have the kids drive the management of it to a great degree and they need tools to do that. And so this allows for that structural flexibility, so if something is a waste of a kid's time, they don't need to do it, they can do something else. But it also allows for the second thing that's critical, which is you get a digital representation of the important things a child does in the classroom without forcing them to do their learning digitally, which has huge negatives once you get over a pretty low threshold. And this has been the one drum that the, the education space has been beating for 25 years because it's cost improving and it can be quality improving, but up to a point. We don't want more digital learning than we're already seeing in a lot of spaces, but we want digital tools to be able to create that journal of what's happening so we can understand what's working and what's not working and we can build on it every week. The second thing we have here is a learning progression, which is essentially a real-time dashboard for educators to use for each of their students. And this is in its infancy. This is not the sophisticated tool that five or 10 years from now I could put in front of you. But what's neat here is you can take a variety of standards that are totally flexible. You could take Common Core, you could take International Baccalaureate, you could take Montessori, you could take whatever you want. And you can build a probabilistic assessment model from that where you can take in everything you've got. You can take in standardized tests, you can take in the implicit behavior of the student with the playlist, you can take in the sensor data from that microphone. And you can take in the reflection of the actual human beings, the student, their parents, the teacher, every time they finish the playlist item, at the end of a week, at the end of a month, during their planning time for the next month. And you can try and understand what do you think will happen with this student if they were to take a standardized test, right? So again, it's not getting rid of standardized tests, it's not getting rid of second opinion, it's just trying to do less of them and have them be less invasive and having your assessment be an input into your decision making instead of a backwards looking measure for the institution. And the critical thing here is a return to what assessment used to mean. Assess means to sit beside. If you take a kind of Latin root, we wanna use technology so we can sit beside the student as they you know, press the gas or the brake on their own learning and give them back their fuel economy instead of forcing them to stop what they're doing, do this other thing which is incredibly invasive, which destroys their intrinsic motivation, which we're trying to build above all, right? And gives us something that we can barely read or act on, right? Trying to move to that more ideal assessment and that balance between, again, having a common standard of what kids should do, but giving them the freedom to flex against that and the experience that they have. And then the third piece that you have here is a parent portal which is actually a series of different tools that do everything from give a kind of news feed like view for a parent into what's happening and being able to participate in that, that classroom and then site and network wide community, helping you do all the planning so you, you can do ride sharing, you can manage what time you're picking your kid off, you can deal with the billing, you can coordinate with your divorce ex-spouse, which is a huge problem that schools and parents have. You can revoke the permission of someone to pick up your kid or manage their permission forms. Basic, basic stuff in technology that has not been able to be comprehensively applied. And then finally, you can get that transparency in a reasonable down res way from that learning progression so that you can participate, so that you can see what you might do on the weekend to further a milestone for your child that matters to you and should mat matter to your child. And start to break down that bridge, uh, start to break down that gap between home and school. And the thing is, these start to be a kind of critical mass, we believe, 
of technologies operating together to set up a different experience at a lower level than you tend to see technologies. And again, that goes back to where we see our role as technologists, which is to build an operating system that's informed by the schools that we run ourselves. We eat our own dog food, but the purpose of this is to go much broader. I used to work for Disney, and it, Disney used a lot of technology, but it was all about the experience. And it sounds like you're taking that same you know, mentality here as you're building the infrastructure for all schools. That's right, and, and you know, I'm a, I'm a technologist, but I'm really a kind of user-driven design convert above all. And I think that you need to set up the, the opportunity to use, use, use design thinking and be iterative and, and use technologies as a supporting input, not as the kind of experience itself. And, and that's what we've been able to do, again, in the very, very early stages in a very small way and understand just like how unbelievably hard it is to run a bad school, let alone a good school. And we're nowhere near running the good schools that we want in the very, very idealized fraction of what is a much more complex and much harder space, but we're excited to kind of start to move beyond that yeah. first phase. Mm -hmm. So your first school is a roughly 20 kid private school. You're talking about these 80 to 100 kid schools. What does alt school mean for public education for other folks who aren't in the private school system? So, you know, alt school is right now just these first party schools that we run and they're idealized. It's like if someone came to me and said, I want to totally change the doctor's experience, my response would not be, great, go to Syria, work with doctors without borders as the bombs are falling. Like, I would say, go to a cosmetic surgery clinic in Beverly Hills and see if you can change it there. And if you can change it there, maybe go a little bit further and a little bit further and a little bit further. And, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to start in the easy part of the education picture, but say, how could we do something that's actually quite different where we think at some point we can move from this first phase where it's just us, we're the only ones doing it, we're the only ones building it, and we're only doing it in this very narrow, easy slice of the pie, and start to say, well, how can we partner with others to create some very different experiences that still ring true to what we think education might look like, that still make use of these more fundamental capabilities that we're building, and eventually, how can we create an ecosystem that's not just about people starting micro schools, but it's actually about the air that everybody breathes who educates children. And we have a very different dynamic a generation from now instead of the kind of time traveler cliche persisting. And, and we are very, very, very patient. We are very long term. You know, I, I have a 10 year vest. My two year old will graduate from old school middle school, if not old school high school by then. Yeah. And well, let me, let me that's the it, kind it, of frame. It, it always seems like the future of education is two to three years away. You've got a lot of entrepreneurial folks here in the audience. When, if ever, can they use the alt school platform? So I, is there another slide on yes, here? Yes, there is. Um, so you know, this is a little bit premature. And, uh, and so I'd ask that people don't kind of overstate it. And in fact, if we can keep it a little secret in this room, that Talking would be to great. Talking you, Mary Joe Maddox. Talking to you. Don't, don't tweet <laughs> this. Don't blog this, please. Um, but, but we hope around mid-year to basically announce publicly um, with some pretty amazing backing that we're kind of ready to start some partnerships with people who want to open a micro school. And we believe we have something to add, whether it's helping them set up that school, whether it's helping them run that school with the kind of centralized administration capabilities that we have whether it's about creating that platform for a more personalized student experience and where we can tie them to all the schools that we run, obviously, but also all the rest so that they're part of a network, they're part of a community that can grow and get better the more people are in it instead of grow and get worse the more people are in it, as I think the kind of model of education that we have today, unfortunately, exhibits. And so, you know, this is just really small. Like, here's an email address. Email us. We want to talk to you six months before we would announce something because you're the kind of people that we want to partner with. We want to give you the tools to start an amazing 100-kid school with, you know, four classrooms that span all the grade levels from kindergarten through eighth grade or maybe just a middle school, maybe something that's farther afield than what we would do anytime soon, and understanding that the first kind of partnerships that we do will be fairly incremental. They'll be likely more urban schools. They'll likely be more expensive schools. But the hope is that, you know, 
September 2019, September 2020, you're going to start seeing some schools that are very, very different. And you're going to allow us at Old School to do what we really came here for, which is to kind of fade into the background and start to become a platform and a pillar of a much bigger ecosystem than us. I have one lightning round question for you, one sentence answer. So uh, the t most scariest thing for Google where you used to work is four 22-year-olds in a garage. Uh, if four 22-year-olds get in a garage and they try to out-innovate uh, alt school, uh, what do you think they're going to be working on? It's impossible. That's why I'm doing this. That's <laughs> I have to do something that four 22-year-olds in a garage can't do because I have kids and I don't want to eat ramen and my back hurts, and so <laughs> uh, I, I can do this. Awesome. Please give a warm thank you to Max and Bia for joining us today. Last but not least, I'd like to uh, welcome our good friend Colin Rodister, who's from the White House, who's going to talk to us uh, about the Connect Ed initiative. Thanks so much. Um, so really excited to be here, former Bay Area Corps member, and uh, my former executive director is in the crowd right now. So happy to be here. Um, I'm here today, you know, we've heard some really exciting stories of innovation and the personalized learning that Desiree's students are utilizing in the classroom every day. And the president really cares about this, and that's why in 2013 he launched uh, the Connect Ed initiative, which is designed to help all schools make digital transformations. Connect Ed is agnostic to the model of teaching. We simply want to provide all teachers and principals the tools that they need to, to work their magic in schools. And this couldn't happen without infrastructure, and that's why we've injected $8 billion to help all schools get Wi-Fi and broadband. And today, over the next, uh, we know that over the past two years, uh, 20 million more students now have broadband connections in their schools. And exactly two years ago, uh, we drove out to Bucker Lodge M Middle School with the president, a Title I school in Maryland, to announce that then $750 million worth of free resources, now 2.25 billion, are available to teachers and, and principals. And uh, I just wanted to talk about that today so that you can take advantage of those. Um, five million students are utilizing these in the classroom today. Uh, some of them, like Apple's commitment, have been utilized, but there's a lot more on the table. For example, uh, Adobe has hundreds of millions of dollars worth of free Photoshop equipment. Sprint has mobile broadband. And Coursera and edX are providing free teacher uh, training sur sources and um, in the next few weeks, we're going to be uh, launching the Open eBooks initiative, and that's going to be providing $250 million worth of free eBooks to all students in Title I schools and all special education students. It's something I'm really excited about, something I would have loved to provide my students with. Um, so that's it. I just wanted to encourage you to go to whitehouse.gov slash connected to learn more about these. And if you want to go ahead and register for Open eBooks so you can be some of the first teachers to take advantage of, you can go to openebooks.net. Thanks so much. Thank you, Colin. Thank you for joining us this morning. I hope you guys had a great time. I think one of my big takeaways is innovation and change doesn't come from a stage or a day. It comes from the folks in this room. There are a ton of people around who want to support your ideas from the you know, TFA social entrepreneurs uh, group to 4.0 schools where I work to Leap Innovations, New School Venture Fund, Charter School Growth Fund. I mean, there's a ton of organizations around the country who want to support you and your ideas because if you've learned anything over the last 10 years is that power is shifting to uh, teachers, is shifting to students, is shifting to parents. So uh, I look forward to see what you guys have in store for us. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>